All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is an audience development webinar where we're talking about how to develop target and reach the right audience. My name is Laval Chichester. I am the CMO of Jump Crew, and I'm your host today. So Jump Crew is an outsourced sales and marketing company. We help clients find and close the right customers so they could increase their revenue and, uh, and their business, right? And audiences are a core component of that. And so with me, we have Rand Fishkin, who's the co-founder of SparkToro, Christopher Boone, who's SVP and Enterprise Solutions of uh, Distillery, and Anna Crow, head of content of Lead Feeder. So I'm going to let these amazing people uh, introduce themselves, starting with Rand. Howdy, gang. Uh, thrilled to be here. Laval, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am, yeah, so I started a company called uh, Moz, which folks might be familiar with in the SEO software space, and then left a couple of years ago, started this new company, SparkToro, which is in the market research and audience intelligence space. And uh, mostly what I wanna do here today is help you find and reach the right audiences. Uh, I, I really care a lot and have a lot of experience around sort of top and middle of funnel. And so that's where uh, I'm gonna try and share my expertise today. Awesome. Boone? Hey guys, my name is Boone. Um, Lifelong friends of Laval, which probably is what got me here more than anything else, and proud to be so. Um, so I run Enterprise Solutions at the AI company called Distillery, based in New York. The first half of my career was on the brand side at uh, Red Bull, Vitamin Water, a few other brands, and then I went into the data and analytics side, and that's where I've been since. And uh, very excited about this conversation. I think it's a great one. We've seen many different ways, so excited to uh, jump into it. Awesome. And Anna? Hey guys, I am Anna Crow. I'm the head of content at Leadfeeder. Leadfeeder is a B2B marketing automation tool that helps you align your marketing and sales teams a little bit better using buyer intent data. So really helps tie together this theme of audience development today. Um, I'm also the assistant editor at Search Engine Journal, repping our shirt today. Um, so check it out. Um, and then um, previously before that, I've worked with brands like Philip Morris International in Switzerland, um, Marriott and IHG in Australia and Japan, it was super interesting, um, and Mailboat Records. So I got to be the voice of Jimmy Buffett for his blogs and on his social media, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> wow. We've got oh, some we're really this out now. <laughs> <laughs> no. We've got some really cool, cool people here. Um, you know, Rand started the SEO industry and helped grow it. So I like to embarrass him. A lot of us have jobs because of him. Anna, you're absolutely cool. So um, kudos <laughs> to you. And I used to break dance and, and Boone used to um, DJ and that's how we met years ago. So now cool. here we are. So we all stumbled into uh, into you know this fun world that we live in. And all right. Today. So what I'm learning is I'm the least cool person here. That's <laughs> well, but not a surprise. So I saw you. You made the the best. That was it? What is it? Um, carbonara. That is right? true. When it comes to making pasta at home, I got your back. If you need the <laughs> secrets, you, you let me know. There you go. So um, quick house rules. So you're all muted so that we can just keep the conversation flowing. Uh, questions, submit them because we'll do Q&A uh, at the end. But if there are awesome questions th that I see flowing in, I'm going to pull some. Um, we have a, uh, we wrote an audience development guide with a fun TAM Excel calculator tour for you to take away. Uh, we'll, you'll get that at the end of this. And then at the back of that guide, you can learn more about Spark Tour Distillery and Lead Feeder. And then at the end, we're also going to have a quick poll so that we can make these things better. But um, before we kick things off, I want to jump in to just some quick use cases on, on um, how all of these, these tools work. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Anna, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but um, uh, last time when we were doing the prep for the webinar, I actually, I was checking out Lead Feeder and I was like, oh, this is so cool. This is amazing. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited for uh, Laval to, to jump in. I haven't, I have not checked out Distillery much yet. So I look forward to learning about that too. Yeah. So, so this is Distillery and what, so we have all our, our tags, all of our websites. So Junk Crew owns 
brands like military brands like Ahern and My Base Guide, and we own our own sites, obviously. And we use Distillery to really get a, a snapshot of who's coming to the site, um, their age, demographics, uh, their behaviors, what websites and places that they visit. And um, also, if we wanted to activate and actually reach this audience, we could basically activate and buy media um, all across the web, right? So Distillery is very, very cool. I really highly recommend that you go check them out. And then... Uh, Boone, sorry, can I can I jump in and ask? Uh, how, how, what's, the, what's the data source on the demographic stuff? Is that implied based on IP? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the quick summary is we're tracking approximately 250 million people in the US every day anonymously. And we see up to 10 million data points on every single person. So we're passively observed, behavioral modeled Got on it. each so person. it's like an opt-in panel type thing? No, it's not opt-in, it's passively observed. So it's like a fly on the wall over everybody in the United States. And then we're, uh, we basically build propensity models and predictive models to predict audience outcomes. So the demographics actually we just launched and we're updating right now. They're built on probabilistic behaviors, but we're starting to ingest the larger uh, demographic data sets that we all know and love and use out there to drive these models. So the demo is actually one of the newest pieces, whereas predicting behaviors and what people will do next is the real core of the business. And that's some of the other screens we're not going to go into today, but happy to talk about it anytime. This is sweet. All right. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. I need to write about this. Yeah. And then hopping over to you, Rand. So I just ran app development, but um, I mean, I think the fact that you moved into audiences is, is super important, especially when you're doing research. But when you look at SparkToro, you could really find out if, if this is what you're, you're, you're targeting the, the topic that you're targeting, you could ask all of these different questions about, about that specific audience. And then random team give you really good information about the podcast, the websites, and, and more insight into this audience. So it's really, really cool. And um, and I think it's go uh, this is going to become core to anyone who is doing content strategy or launching launching a product. And then Lead Feeder, you know, we have Lead Feeder on jumpcrew.com. And what this allows us to do is really see who is visiting the website from a, from what company they're coming in from and then organize that data. And so in this specific use case, we saw that Ma MasterCard landed on the site, right? They came through Google, um, they landed in April, and then they visited these pages, right? So now what this allows me to do is send this to my sales teams and say, hey, look, um, reach out to M MasterCard and you know, their lead field provides you um, people who work at MasterCard right here. So now the prospecting on the sales side becomes easier for my team because they could find the right person and really sort of talk to them about um, about email marketing or sales enablement marketing, which is look, which looks like what they're interested in, right? So those are two, those are a few really um, quick use cases. And then so I'll pass it back to all of you and maybe we start Can I with... ask Anna a question about uh, uh, lead feeder too? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, sweet. I, I was gonna ask the, um, uh, the contact data, is that uh, crawl data, is that provided by a third party or is that something that is connected up through the like IP address to back to the search, something like that? So it's a little bit of everything. So we use Hunter, IO and Cold Contact to gather data. And then yeah, we also use, okay. yeah, we also use their IP address and then we also use our own first party data. So we actually have like a huge team of data analysts that kind of clean up our data. Love it, yeah, it's, su it's super smart. Is that, so years ago, this is a long time ago, but when I was uh, starting SEO Moz, I used a company, I think they were called like Manticore or something way back in the day. And they had uh, that, like the IP address of the company that probably visited your site. And it was huge for us because we would do exactly what you were talking about. You know, I'd write blog posts and then I'd reach out to those folks and be like, hey, you know, would someone be interested in chatting? And uh, it was it was a great sort of like warm open instead of a cold open. 
Yeah, we've actually had a few before we were like targeting marketers a lot and now we've been targeting salespeople a lot. And I've been really surprised to see like how well our their outreach performs now using our data. It's really interesting and fascinating because sales is like a whole new world to me versus marketing and SEO. So yeah, cool. yeah that's um, makes a ton of sense. Really, really smart. Laval, thank you for showing those off. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think the reason I've gathered this particular tool set together is because they one, you know, we have to find the best in class tech for for our for one ourselves and then for our clients. And two, they're also different, but they're also useful in in their own unique way, which I really really enjoy. And um and then going from I'm in the position where I have the marketing background, and now Anna, like you said, the sales world is I've been living it for like deeply now for two years and it's remarkable and the pairing of both worlds and the both data sets is super important and um yeah and and that's that's really what it's about if someone lands on your site and you've identified that they've visited places already it's a when you do on the sales side reach out to them it's um just better you're going to get a better result right and uh so quick question what would we all define an audience as like what is actually audience development so that everyone listening could understand what we're talking about. Ray, so, you want to uh, kick it off? Oh man! All right. So, <laughs> I, full, full disclosure to uh, to those of you attending and listening, we were having this discussion the other day, and uh, and I said I I really like this question, but um, I also am curious about what audience development is and and laval and, and boone of course jumped in and were like hey here's you know here's how we define it and, and how we look forward to it i i have certainly done this practice myself and um wh when i think of audience development right at the companies that i've founded and and built uh essentially it is part of how i build a marketing and sales and conversion flywheel right it's how i establish uh, the group of people that are in our target audience, which is much bigger than the people that we just want to sell to, right? The, the audience can involve a community and then developing that community into people who know our brand, trust our brand, like our brand, and are familiar with us so that when they have the problem that our company solves, they want to come to us. Right. To me, that's audience development. Rand is always the best at kicking these things off. That's why I always <laughs> turn to him first. You um, have started with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Now we got nothing to say exactly. Um, I mean, it, it's a great topic, and I would say this: if the two most fundamental questions in business are who are my customer and how do I find more of them, then audience development is potentially the process of answering and achieving what those two questions propose. Um, it can be done in many different ways across, depending on what you're promoting. Are you promoting a product, a politician, a music performer? But everybody's looking to develop their audience. So I'm excited to jump into kind of uh, unpacking uh, the process of audience development as seen by different people across the industry. But overall, growing your audience. Yeah, Boone, it's um, interesting to see you take that, that take on it. And same thing with you, Rand, because from a content perspective, obviously I live in content, it takes a little bit of a different approach for me. Um, I like to see audience development essentially helps me discover what content is helping impact the bottom line. So like one example at Lead Feeder, we used, um, we used our audience development to see what paid campaigns were performing well. Um, and we noticed, for example, our paid campaigns kind of sucked on weekends or out of work hours. Um, so based on our audience development data that we were gathering from Lead Feeder, our customer support team, our sales team, we tweaked those to make our ad campaigns only focused on work hours and within those time zones and countries. So it was really, it's just interesting to see how different people look at audience data and how they use it. Absolutely. And then were you actually buying, uh, uh, were you doing paid campaigns for your content? Yes. Oh, cool. This, yeah. is, uh, this is um, relatively unusual, but I guess makes makes sense in sort of the, um, you know, B2B sales world. So you were basically buying ads on, is it, was it mostly social, mostly search or both? Both, so we do Google ads and mostly LinkedIn ads just for our space B2B, it makes more sense. Got it, and then that would go to like a, a white paper, a blog post? Yeah, so we're driving obviously sort of lead gated content, mostly white papers. Huh, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, lead gated content, that makes total sense, smart. Yeah. Right, and then for, for everyone, here 
um, Anna, this is for you. Where do you see that your, that website, your website, our company's website? Um, how important is that to that this whole audience development process? Um, it, it's massive because, as I you know I mentioned, our content supports the bottom line, and pretty much all the content on our website is affected by audience development. You know, do we see more purchases from product reviews, or are, do we get more signups? Um, you know, it it constantly changes for us, and our website is our bread and butter since we are a SaaS company. That's right. That's very cool. And then, so the world has shifted. We're sort of in, you know, a predicament. Let's call it that. Um, right now, some brands have paused, and their audiences has totally shifted. Right. Uh, and there are new opportunities because of that, right? For for Jump Crew, we're calling in and targeting a different audience set. Some even now globally, because our data told us that, right? We're getting more leads from the UK, so we've shifted our, our audience, and we're targeting companies like Zoom who allow us to do the, the videos and competitors to that. How has this time shifted, and what can what can be done um, to actually capitalize on it? And Boone, I'll throw that to you. I mean, so speaking of COVID uh, climate and environment that we're living in, I think it's it's way more important even now to really understand your audience. And, you know, in terms of what goes into the recipe of audience development, a lot of there's different scenarios, obviously, but defining who your persona is, finding out where they exist out there, how to target them, how to engage them. But something a lot of people look over is, which I'm a big believer in, is always update and optimize. And a lot of people just kind of rest on, I know who my consumer is. You'd be surprised how many brands will tell you that. And they're the ones who end up getting disrupted by Netflix or by whatever comes along who capture the new consumer. So in a time like this, working across all different industries at Distillery, we see certain client verticals where they're having an increase in engagement, um, job recruiting, LinkedIn and Indeed should be blowing up right now and paying attention to what's going on and how they should shift and their positioning. I would say for any company and market right now where there's an uptick, direct to consumer is 10 times more important now than maybe it ever was. Uh, there was an article in Forbes this week, it's Frito-Lay, very much focusing on their direct to consumer website, snacks.com, uh, P&G's Baby Care, teams promoting their direct to consumer smart home products called Lumi by Pampers. Um, so for those, they're very much thrown into who their new consumers. But what about the the categories that are having a decrease auto dealerships um obviously no one's going to a dealership really right or pharmaceutical sales when pharmaceutical reps can't go to doctor's offices there's a lack of promotion and intel and whatnot so the things we're seeing in those categories is right now studying what are the behavioral changes of your audiences and trying to predict what's going to be stickiest coming out of this so you can get ahead of it and if you're not paying attention especially in a time like this I think it could be really scary if you're just sitting on your hands. Absolutely. And and I'm going to ask all of you, um, what is one thing, right, before we go any further, one thing that any, everyone listening here can do to better understand and, and reach their their, uh, their audience? Um, Anna, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. So um, internally at Lead Feeder, we've kind of shifted our voice and tone. We used to be a little bit snarky, a little bit edgy. Um, but since, you know, March hit us pretty hard, uh, we've shifted our tone to be really empathetic towards our customers. We've taken a customer first approach to our content development um, and shifted that. So um, one example that we did was we created this blog post um, based on email templates for sales teams during COVID-19. The whole focus was to not pitch, not sell your product, just ask people, hey, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Um, and that blog post actually is out surpassing our homepage. It's performing really, really well. Um, but customers want it. And we gathered that information and that intel based on search demand trends, you know, trends for our main keyword terms like lead generation. We saw, we saw a huge drop just because there's no demand for it. Um, so we switched that. But then also our customer support team has been super crucial to us because they're on the front lines. They're talking to our customers every day. So they share this data with us, and then we've shifted our focus to be really empathetic and across the board. Hmm. Rand? Yeah, I, okay, I, I am going to um, say that I, I'm not a big fan of a very classic marketing and product methodology, which is personas. I know a lot of people like to use personas. They like to build, you know, persona models of sort of their customers and, and, 
I don't have a, a fundamental problem with it. I think it is okay. What I really worry about is like when you have, you know, is sales Sally and marketing Mary and like the, um, and these, these uh, persona concepts that have no real human being behind them. Right. And the reason I don't like that is because you cannot ask those people a question. You can make, you know, pe your team can get in a room or get on a Zoom call, make assumptions about what those people want and what they need and how their behavior is changing without ever talking to them. And I don't, I don't find that compelling. What the, the, the method that I really like, the method that um, the most successful products I've launched both at, at Moz and, and with SparkToro, the, the way that's been done is essentially having personal relationships with actual customers. I would encourage, I don't care where you are in your team, you should have some personal relationships with people who are your customers. Uh, and the, having conversations with those people, translating that into interview questions or survey questions that you ask your broader audience, right? So if you hear, hey, we're really focused uh, right now on trying to save budget in our marketing team, rather than trying to uh, grow the number of leads that we acquire, right? So cost savings is the big thing. We're trying to bring CAC down. Oh, okay, that's a big insight. Let me go survey our customers and see how many of you are focused on uh, saving money right now versus acquiring more leads right now. Oh, that is that is a substantive portion, right? It's 70-30, okay. We're, we need to change our positioning, our messaging. Maybe we need to change something about our product and how it helps people, right? So, so I think that that, uh, that deep connection and taking those conversations back to interview and survey data is far more useful than having sort of a persona model and then you know, sliding underneath it, these, these sort of, hey, here's what we're gonna do for this persona, here's what we're gonna do for that persona. It's just my experience. I, I'm that's that's amazing. I'm gonna ask a follow-up before I pass to, to to Boone because you've decided to launch a, a new product in the worst climate <laughs> in like in, in the like the absolute worst circumstances. So yeah. is there anything you've learned from that? And that's one. And two, you know, there are opportunities to launch new products based on what's happening and and you know to in the marketplace like what advice would you give on that yeah uh so let's see F first part is we we launched Farctoro for um a number of reasons we delayed the launch by about a month and a half because of you know the coronavirus outbreak and and the um, attention essentially just not being on new software products in the web marketing space sure. um, we felt like you know if we were being honest and reading the room that was not what people wanted to hear about and so we decided to delay, but we did launch in this kind of terrible economic climate. And you know, the reasons are we were ready to go and delaying was only going to make our sort of burn rate more painful. Um, second, we did see and we waited until we saw this. So um, for those folks who haven't visited it, SparkToro has a, a page on the site called Trending, which is essentially kind of marketing news, right? It's what people like Boone and Laval and Anna and myself uh, tweet and share online aggregated so you can see who's shared that stuff and it updates every few hours. So it's kind of this like hacker news or tech meme, but for marketers. And we saw traffic returning to that after a big dip, right? It went way down at the end of February and into March and it was starting to return in the middle of April. We also saw the same thing, uh, traffic returning, actually going to higher levels than ever before to sites like Indie Hackers and Product Hunt. Mm. Uh, and when we saw that, we figured, okay, people are ready to pay attention again. I think this is part of like your, when you're doing audience development, you wanna have this you know, one-to-one -one connection, but you also want broad aggregated data about your audience. And if you can see that statistically speaking, they are now ready to participate in these conversations, now you can start sharing, right? Anna, the, the reason your blog post did well is because you identified trends that people were interested in, you had this uh, you know, intelligence about what people wanted, and you produced this blog post that did extraordinarily well because of that. And I think that's, that's a huge part of audience development. As for um, things people should do around product in you know, COVID times, I, I think 
um, I think there's there's sort of four categories, right? You can change your product, fundamentally what you do and serve. You can change your positioning, which is kind of how you compare your solution uh, to the problem of space, right? You can, uh, you can change your marketing tactics, the channels you go after, the content you produce, um, or you can change your pricing, right? And, and now might be a great time to do things like, hey, I know a bunch of SaaS companies are doing this, which I think is actually pretty awesome, which is, oh, you, you know, you're calling us up or you're emailing to say, hey, we need to cancel our account. We're just gonna give you three months free or six months free gratis. We understand that a lot of folks have their budget. You need to use our product still. You just, you go ahead, go ahead and use it. Six months, we'll have another conversation about this, which I, awesome. I think that's genius, uh, yeah. personally, right? If you can if you can be that generous, I think that's awesome. But but all four of those are, th are vectors you can make changes happen. Very cool. Boone, one thing. Man, yeah, <laughs> really? See, this, I shouldn't have queued up earlier, Rand, to go for. Um, <laughs> he's just too good. I mean, the one thing I would say, and I'm going to echo a lot of what Anna and Rand said, is just listen, listen to your customer, listen to your consumer, just listen, observe, you know, and and serve them. If you do right by them, whether you're B2B, B2C, and you're listening to what they really want and what they need, and you do right by them, like in the example Rand just gave, you know, that will help you develop that that loyalty, that relationship, and hopefully it goes maybe viral or whatever, it helps you grow, you know, the numbers. But overall, just listen, observe, and understand. Very cool. And then so moving on, we've got the world is changing, right? In in many, many, many different ways. And and companies like Google are are pushing that change. So and and privacy is a big thing. So two prong answer. So question. So from a GDPR and and um the California Act, Protection Act, how how have businesses um or what do they need and this is for you boone what do they need to do to make sure that they are they are targeting the right audience but respecting their privacy and then from a, a google chrome moving to a cookie list world um what does that also mean in terms of privacy thing and like how are you tracking people without cookies now like what what should brands do this is a huge topic. I mean, this is with a lot of privacy lawyers involved, most likely, and I doubt that I'm going to do justice to this in you know 20 seconds or less. Um, this is this is a, a really huge topic, and if you want to get from a very high level in the West, we have an obsession with privacy versus the East. And if you study the differences in different societies and how marketing happens, it's very interesting to see what you can tease out of that. I don't have time to go into that down that rabbit hole, but uh, there's a, a great podcast on VC20 with uh, Sam Lessons, who goes, he goes deep into that, and it was really eye-opening. So if you study that, first and foremost, I think it really helps you compare and understand what we really value over here. How to go to market against that, I mean, GDP, GDPR and CCPA have their own guidelines. Um, to really sum it up, it's like being able to opt yourself in or always have the option to opt yourself out of X, Y, and Z database, whatever it may be. That's super simplifying it. So people, please don't call my cell phone and say I got that wrong. I know, <laughs> but I'm simplifying it because LaValle's only give me 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> I think the bigger question is, you know, as marketers, especially so ingrained in digital, what do we all do in two years? You know, and Cookie Armageddon happens. And you know, no one exactly knows, but you know, we've, we've been getting ahead of this at Distillery for a long time now. We kind of knew this was gonna happen, and it's our patents and our privacy credentials and so on. And some of the things that I will, I think the way I think about it is everybody's looking for a universal ID and some way to track the consumer across platforms, across channels. And that's very interesting. Keep that idea in mind without going down the rabbit hole. Universal ID and be able to understand who that person is. Um, and different ways of, you know, marrying databases and things together, uh, always in a privacy respectful manner. But in the end, Targeting wise, you're gonna see innovation comes from necessity. You're gonna see new ways of modeling consumers, targeting consumers. It can be, I, we believe very much a distillery, it'll be based on behaviors. We have a lot of models that don't use cookies, uh, whether it comes from contextual or whatever channel or whatever it may be. Um, so I think there's gonna be new ways that we go about understanding, uh, organizing, and targeting consumers. And I don't think it's been fully hashed out, but it'll be interesting to see what happens and what innovations come about over the next few years. And then Rand, you're you're crawling millions of profiles, right? So how are you, and you're making it anonymous, like how does that work? 
Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So basically, we just crawl the web and social accounts the same way Google does, and and then index those and don't expose any any PII, um, which yeah helps. But I I will say, you know, on that big picture front, Boone, I um, I am I am so insanely frustrated by what I think was positioned, and and this happens a lot when you get kind of um, whatever, the corporate world and the political world involved together, but what was positioned as this will help consumers have greater privacy when in fact these laws are structured almost exclusively to help Google and Facebook maintain their monopolies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, is, that is all we're talking about here, right? So like the one thing I would urge people to do is to question whether these laws are doing the thing that they pretend to do, right? Which is help consumers. Uh, GDPR does not effing help consumers uh, for 99 out of 100 things that it that it causes, right? I don't think any of us feel more protected because we all have to say accept cookies or whatever when we reach websites. Uh, I, I, the the opt out versus opt in thing is barely a protection. The only thing this really does is ensure that Google and Facebook, who are the only ones who have all of our data and can maintain all of our data because they've we're always logged into them everywhere. Uh, they are the only ones who can sell the most targeted kinds of advertising and thus they can maintain monopolies. I, it boggles my mind that the European governments got together and said, let's make sure no European company can ever compete with the Americans. That is, <laughs> it really is. If you're in the EU and you're on this podcast and you're, you're on this webinar, maybe consider having a conversation with someone in your elected offices. Okay, but uh, on uh, moving on <laughs> from that front, I think what we, the biggest thing I would urge marketers, especially small and medium business marketers to do is get a freaking email address as soon as you can, any way that you can, and have a reason for people to log into your website. That could be to post blog comments, it could be to access uh, gated content like Anna's doing, with lead feeder, it could be to uh, participate in polls, it could be to get access to webinars, whatever the reason, uh, free tools, right? Free tools are a great way to do this, interactive content. Get that login because once someone is logged into your site with their email address, now you can truly observe behavior and do intelligent kinds of behavioral based marketing uh, and audience attraction. You can learn more about those people, you can ask them questions, you can uh, have them basically um, uh, connected to their login, that that would be my my big big push for marketers the next couple of years. I think that is a absolutely wonderful point because what that also does is, you know, all these things that right now the cost acquisition costs if spending money on Google or Facebook or wherever you're spending is lower because there's less competition. But the trend is more people will start to do that, so it's going to increase as soon as you get that that person's email or have that one-to-one -one relationship with them, then that cost, that acquisition cost goes away. So then you could actually start to increase the LTV, the lifetime value of that customer sans without the without that actual cost to acquire them, well, right? You, you, you know well, right? We all know uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, right? Uh, Facebook, average Facebook click-through rate. If you know, if, if lead feeder goes and they put up a post on their Facebook page and they have a thousand fans or, or likes on their page, right? It would reach somewhere between one and 5% of that audience on average, which is pretty crappy, but it's like, okay. <laughs> and today that number is 0 0.08%. Uh, uh, 0.08% on average for a Facebook page. It's you know, you need like a hundred thousand fans before you get ten people paying attention to your post. Why? Why bother? An email address. Open rates in two thousand five were around twenty twenty five percent on average. Today, they're around twenty to twenty five percent on average. Right. Email, email, and your website are like the only channels that haven't been driven into oblivion by these monopolies' need for you know more advertising dollars. Okay, I'll shut up now. No, I think, no, I think I mean, it's great. Yeah, I could do this all night. Yeah, yeah. especially yeah. over drinks. Yeah. I just should lob in some. some <laughs> I'm allowed to meet to get you going, Rand. <laughs> this is great. Um, but I think it. I think like even in the audience development guide, 
we we produced um we didn't cover the importance of email but like i think your that one-to-one -one relationship is so valuable and i think it's i think it's super important um and i think the other thing you could do with those things is actually use it to create lookalike audiences elsewhere of customers that look like your customers that might be be interested so i think that's um i think those are absolutely super points um where what can so what can companies do to plan for what's uh, happening Nabal, anna did you did you have something you wanted to jump in on on uh gpr and cookies and all, all the privacy stuff i would just echo the same you guys have talked about i've we're a Finland-based company, so I'm very familiar with all the fun issues of GDPR. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what, 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 what's next? Do you think in the in in the grow in the next wave of um? <laughs> that just scared me. <laughs> what's um? What's next in the in the the wave of of tracking consumers? Do you think in a in a humane way? Yeah, that's the tricky I, part. <laughs> I mean, my fundamental belief is that most consumers are are happy to trade uh, small amounts of non-invasive privacy in exchange for better web experiences, better yeah. content, better advertising, better products. Right? I I am certainly among that group. I don't mind the fact that if people happen to know what my job title is, or where I'm located, or what time I visit their websites, this data does not harm me in in any real way and so um i'm more than happy to to give that i don't mind opting into it but i'm also fine with opting out of it and i think most consumers are the same way you, you can see in all the studies right that people are the overwhelming majority at least of americans are willing to trade privacy in exchange for very slightly better experiences um and so you know my suspicion is this will be mostly a battle that is fought between um uh, politicians and corporate lobbyists and so if if you and your company want to get involved in that battle i think that's where you go have that fight uh not with i don't think you have to really convince a lot of consumers to you know sway things one way or another I'm, i'll jump in on that I, i'm in full agreement i think for a better experience a better product a better a value exchange if I'm going to get a better experience, I will give up my information. My uh, cell phone company has my information in great detail, right? So whether it's an out-of-brand experience on the marketing, paid media side, in-brand, whether it's website, customer support, uh, customer journey, and so on, just a better experience overall, you're probably willing to buy into it. And everybody's got to really think about that is what are you willing to buy in? What is the value exchange? You know, when people complain about Facebook, and I'm not a huge Facebook fan, I will say that, but if people complain about it, you've been getting it for free forever. Like, you know, that doesn't something sit off with you on that? So I think there's got to be a value exchange. And if it enhances your experience, I think we will see uh, a lot of people buying in. Yeah, right. I'll add to that, Boone. Um, I think, too, there's going to be a huge shift in first party data. We're already starting to see that on the lead feeder side. Um, but we've actually started tried, tried to develop tools just to focus on first party data. Um, and I think we're gonna see a lot more restrictions happen, especially with Google and the other monopolies that are gonna take over. Um, for example, in the beginning of February, Google Analytics removed their network report, which caused a lot of problems for people. So I think people that are depending on tools like that need to find a different solution and best. I'm, gonna, I'm really glad you brought that up, Anna. The first party thing is huge, you're right. We're seeing it everywhere. And everything we talked about earlier, direct line of sight, direct to consumer, trying to collect a first party data set, you know? And if, when you only sell soap through Walmart, it's very hard to do, but every brand is striving for that. And you're right on, it's gonna become even more powerful. And you see that across publishers and other um, groups that own some kind of first party data set and trying to figure out exactly how to leverage it best for their brand. That's a great uh, point. Yeah. Anna, can I ask, uh, you, you mentioned like, hey, people should be thinking about switching tools. Do you have a, an alternative or an additional suggestion on top of Google Analytics to to be able to get some of that, you know, data that's going away or will be going away? Um, just similar to what you said, create your own data, um, create a login, create an email. I would do that. Um, also, there's tools, you know, like Lead Feeder and other tools that offer first-party data. Um, 
right now we're also still pretty dependent on Google Analytics, but we're, we actually have a team that's building out our own first party data so we don't have to depend on them anymore. Is that gonna be productized for other companies to use as well? We're hoping. <laughs> yeah, come on. I love it. <laughs> Plus, I, you know, I, I really, uh, I would like to see more Finnish companies succeed. I wanna, you know, get that, uh, get, get not just Americans dominating the web landscape. I feel like yeah, Google Analytics too. I, I don't know about your your sense, but my sense is that it has become next to uh, unusable for anyone but a, a, a an expert who spends tons of time in there all the time. Like getting the the basic insights from GA is just incredibly frustrating, and the degree to which they have made their UI just overly complex to find you know, basic path analysis, basic, you know, which channels send me the best converting customers. My God, the amount of work that you have to put into that is ludicrous. And I think to, the, to that point, I think they're trying to make it better for the user, but just complicating it. And um, and just on, on that note, we got a question in from Michael and, he, and Rand, it was a, on a point that you made, and he's basically asking, um, do we think that, we've over segmented basically is what he's asking like do you think we have to segment so deeply in our audience development or have we just gone crazy i added the crazy part for emphasis <laughs> i think that we can we can get uh, overly segmented um my sense is the the way to avoid this is to look at um behavioral data plus uh, survey and interview data, and then group people into like buckets um, rather than trying to break out. It, this is another challenge with persona modeling that I have is oftentimes there'll be seven personas, right? And our product serves these four. It doesn't serve these three. We're directing our product efforts to like this one persona for our next release, yada, yada. And, and in fact, what we've done is oh, exactly um, to this question's point, right? Overly segmented. Uh, when the the if you if you are able to connect up the uh, behavior and sort of sentiment um, uh, and, and problem space need like problem solution need, you can group people into far fewer quadrants. We we saw this like Moz saw this for sure with um, agencies, consultants, and in-house marketers, right? Which were like the three big target segments. And uh, we overly complicated it for a long time and then sort of simplified and we're like, oh, okay, agencies need this to report to clients the almost exact same way in-house people need it to report to their boss and teams. So other than the fact that we have, you know, a few agency functions to allow that, let's, let's make this a really, really similar pitch. Absolutely. Um, so please send your questions in. We're, we're getting close to the end. I've got one straight for you. It's uh, Tom is sending you some meat, Rand. But before I go there, I want to um, I want to ask you, Anna. So lead feeder is great, and this I, I guess anyone could chime in. But Anna, for you first, lead feeder is great. I love the data I get. I could go. I know you. You've come to my site. I don't know you personally, but I know your company. What do you? What would you give? salespeople or even marketers who reach out after that tips to be less creepy basically <laughs> that's a really good question we get that a lot um because it is creepy people are like whoa you're just visiting my site why are, why are you emailing me um but it's just a nice touch point you know a lot of salespeople and marketers even when i do outreach for guest blog posts or link building i use our tool too um, but it's just great to understand what they're looking at so a lot of what I'll do is I'll look and see, okay, they checked out our pricing page. Maybe they looked at one of our resource page on lead generation and they looked at our solutions lead generation page. So obviously they're interested in lead generation and it's just a nice way to personalize your pitch more. Um, so you're not just coming in super cold, you know about them a little bit. Um, maybe you've stalked a bunch of people on LinkedIn or Twitter. <laughs> maybe you know they have a dog. So <laughs> it just helps add to that personalization segment. That's very cool. And I, then, do, uh, I do something like this. This is not, I don't use lead feeder for it, but like whenever someone signs up for SparkToro, we're early, right? So we only have whatever, 160 customers. But like uh, whenever somebody signs up, I email them personally. Like I just write them a, 
a personalized email. And I do, I go, you know, I go click on their account and I figure out who they are and I like look at their LinkedIn and I look at their Twitter and whatever. Oftentimes, if I find them super interesting, I'll actually follow them on those services. But people don't, I, I have not gotten the, I was creeped out by this. I've only gotten the, oh, wow, you're really going the extra mile and like this is super cool and we're having a conversation. So I think there's a, I don't know, maybe maybe this is this speaks to the importance of um, emotional intelligence and being able to just have a lot of empathy and and perception around what's um, appropriate and not right. So if you reach out to someone and say, "Hey, Lead Feeder told me uh, someone from your organization was checking out our site. Is there anything I can be helpful with? I saw that you guys do X. Uh, we actually are really passionate about." helping with this problem that often happens with X. I don't think that's terrible. You know, Rand, I think that's unfair though, because if you emailed me, I do jumping jacks and push-ups because Rand Fish can just email me. So that's a, <laughs> that's a bit unfair, but I think it, the latter part of your advice was very good. <laughs> no, this does speak though, this does speak though to the value of building a brand that people know, right? Because if someone reaches out from ooglyboogly.com, you're like, I, who are you? It seems sketch. I don't know you. But if somebody reaches out from uh, distillery or lead feeder, right, or uh, jump crew, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I know them. I've heard of them. I have like a positive association. That's not sketchy or weird. So brand building is huge in this. Um, Ross Simmons had this great tweet the other day where he was talking about like all these direct uh, marketers and web marketers who undervalue brand and don't recognize how much it boosts everything else you do, mm -hmm. right? So you say like, oh, it's exciting to get an email from Rand Fishkin, but it's exciting, like when I get an email or a retweet or a follow from somebody who works at a company I know, um, like Ravensburger Puzzles signed up and I was like, oh my God, I played that as a kid, like how cool is this? <laughs> right? So it, it, like that, that association is just super powerful. That's absolutely fair. Touche. Okay. Um, one thing. So I'm going to go to this question from Tom. Um, shout out to Mercury. They make the best apps in the world. Um, so basically his question is, do you think Amazon's growth in the digital advertising business in business represents another mono, monopolistic threat, um, i.e. Google, Facebook? Go ahead, Rand. <laughs> <laughs> I think you already answered that, right? <laughs> Let's go back to it, though. Uh, okay, so I, I think Amazon is a general monopoly danger around e-commerce, but to be fair to them, uh, they are under 50% market share in e-commerce uh, in the US and globally, whereas Google is 94% of the search market, right? And Facebook is like 80 something percent of the social media market. So, you know, Amazon does have a lot more competition from tons of small, medium, sites, right? Um, and I think this, uh, the COVID crisis has actually created a lot of disruption opportunities with Amazon for a ton of e-commerce players, which is kind of exciting to see, right? Um, so I, I, I will say that. I, um, I think if you are in e-commerce and you want to use Amazon as a platform to do advertising and marketing on, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I would urge you to do what what Boone and Anna and I have been talking about uh, throughout this webinar, which is which is to collect as much first party data, collect that email address as soon as you possibly can um, from those folks. What from, you know, and, and that might even mean doing things that you wouldn't ordinarily do for other visitors when someone comes from Amazon um, to be able to capture that. Because what you don't want to do is get into a place where you're reliant on Amazon's platform to send you customers. They have proven they are a bad, bad partner to everyone. It is just in their DNA to screw anyone who's um, in their ecosystem. You saw what they did with, um, uh, whatchamacallit, everybody who sends them, what is that, affiliates? All the, all the Amazon affiliates, was it last month or two months ago? Like in the, in the middle of the worst part of COVID in the US um, and globally, they cut affiliate revenues from like, you know, by 90% or something, which just, <laughs> I, wow. was mind-boggling. Wow. They basically said, we that don't need affiliates help getting customers anymore, so screw you. 
I mean, affiliates help build their business. That is wow. That's terrible. I can't believe uh, that. They they have a short memory <laughs> and no loyalty. And wow. But on the positive of Amazon, though, and to reinforce what everyone just said, the way Amazon built a really amazing business and brand is capturing that first party data. It's all by getting that data and then really using it to make their product and their their thing better, right? Like they, they created the one click checkout yes. and that one click innovation checkout that they pat patented, I think the patent ran out a few years ago, but that's that billion dollars for them plus i think but it also created like ease of behavioral changes in in us as the consumers right so i think that's a positive thing that's exactly what you guys are saying that they did they were able to capture that that data the consumer and then make their product better for them um and so i have another question i think we're wrapping up soon but boone i'm going to throw this to you so how do you balance audience segmentation based on how consumers or client clients self-report on a lead form versus from passively observed data. Um, that's a great question. Um, this also kind of touches on the question earlier about are we over segmenting and over analyzing. Uh, so distillery takes a very different approach to segmentation. I have to put that forward. Most segmentation is done through a panel of 2000 people and you survey them and you end up with six personas and the first one's Mary going back to what Rand said earlier, and, and they're a little bit ridiculous because how do you take Mary from the PowerPoint deck and turn it into a marketing plan, right? And it usually speaks to creative and whatnot. The way we look at segmentation is because we're basically tracking a, a representative view of the US population, we let the AI do the work. We'll take your first party data set, whether it's a pixel on your site, your CRM list, an email list, or what is the DNA of your customer for your brand? And then we'll build an AI model on that it will look at the US population and will, it'll kick back maybe nine segments. And of those, it'll tell us how many people in the US are in each segment. So what we end up doing with the client is saying, these top four segments make up 87% of the market. So forget the others, just focus on these four. You can see how many people, potential customers, are in each of A, B, C, D. And then we can unpack each segment and find out what's going on with them. Why did the AI put all these people in A? And start to dive into it more. So it's a little bit more of an observed listening approach than a, um, uh, a survey approach, and I do believe you should marry reported survey, social focus groups, interviews with behavioral observed, and they go best when together. But the problem with historical segmentation is one, mainly you have a hypothesis. You have questions to this group thinking you know who your customer is. But what if you missed an entire consumer segment? You know, when we were launching Smart Water, we had a bunch of nursing homes in Long Island writing us letters about Smart Water, and we couldn't figure out why, and it was because doctors were prescribing it due to dehydration. That's a segment we would have never thought about. We were going after yoga people in the city, you know? So when you're going with a hypothesis, you have a bias, but when you're using AI at scale, it'll kick back what it truly sees. And that's been a great way of uncovering new segments, living in your blind spots, and kind of revamping or turning the game of segmentation on its head. And then we've just now, and I'll end here, we've just now been able to figure out a process to actually recruit people from Persona A into a survey. So the AI figures out who your customers should be, and then to Rand's point, you can recruit some of them into a survey and ask them deeper questions on why did you buy a red car and not a blue car, which uh, our systems won't tell you the why. It'll tell you the who, the where, the when, the what, but not the why. I hope that hey, can I just ask, what, what, are, what are examples of those, um, those, those nine segments that you talked about? Um, so basically, it's, not, um, it, it's basically going to be a cluster, a population, a, a, a subpopulation, where the AI says, out of all the people who have gone to your website or in your CRM or whatever it may be, um, we took that, built a model, and went across the US, and it kicked back nine clusters of people. Basically, a total addressable market for your brand, and then automatically cluster them on behavioral attributes, what people have done over time. Oh, oh. Say, so it's not the same call, nine for everyone, it's like it's unique to your exactly. visitors based on their behavior. Based right. on your brand's DNA. It could be five, nine, 12, but the main point is it shows us the market opportunity, how many people are in each, so we can pick basically the biggest ones to go after, um, but it'll find different types of personas based on behavior that are interacting with your brand and then finding people who act like act like it out in the market. And that's so it's a very good. it's a very different way. That, that's because their, their their website was pixeled, right? It could be a pixel on a website, this one first party data set, CRM, email list. Uh, we've brought a lot of new products from uh, to market in the US. Um, like oat milk we helped bring to the US and they weren't sure if Americans would drink oat milk. So we hey, can I use products. Oat milk. 
It's pretty good. It's, good. it's huge. Yeah. Delicious. So it doesn't have to just be on like a pixel or a CRM list. It could also be for, we bring a, help bring a lot of new products to market. Um, and there's a different process to that, but I can go through another time. But yeah, it's interesting. All right, we've got three minutes. I'm going to ask, I'm going to, there's one question. All right, this is from Zeke. Uh, basically, it says, how do you restart the one-to-one -one relationship in a hard hit industry? So I would, I'll add to this. So in an industry that's devastated, let's say payday loans or hospitality, where it's like predatory, or when you're like spammed someone too much and they want to get rid of you from an email list, how do you repair the relationship, that one-to-one -one relationship? How do you get that trust back? Anna, I'm going to go with you first. That's a tough one. Uh, but we are lucky enough to have a great customer success team. So a lot of our approach is manual. So we don't necessarily hit the kind of quantity we want to hit, but we hit the quality we want to hit. Um, we understand, we try to be empathetic as I talked about earlier, but we try to position ourselves as a way of like, hey, we can pause your account right now, like Rand mentioned for a couple months, whatever you know works for you, and then revisit that relationship later. Um, we'll also just try to offer them resources, just say, hey, that's cool, I understand, we'll stop your, your account right now, but how about next week we have a chat and I send you, you know, free coffee from Starbucks, I get it delivered for you. So we do like little personalized touch points um, based on our lead segment. So if it's a tier, a higher tier client, we obviously focus more on them and we have the personal touch, whereas some of our lower level clients, we, can't, we don't have enough manpower to actually reach out to them. So we just have to let those people go and it, it's sad, but we will also retarget them later in the future, hopefully whenever things turn around. Very cool. Boone, you wanna go? Um, sure, that, that is a really, really tough one. It depends on if you want to do it at scale, if you're Marriott, for instance, you know, we're talking about hospitality or um, a little more one-to-one. -one. But at the, at the core of it all, I feel like, again, the value exchange and being authentic. And a huge part of sales and audience development within the sales and marketing side is truly understanding your people, whether I'm on the sales side, so understanding my customers, what's going on in their lives and, and truly caring, like really, truly caring about them as people. And when you have that relationship, that will weather through the storm. If you're talking about it at scale and you're a hotel chain, a family chain or a family business, whatever it may be, uh, let's say a restaurant, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I, I would always go back to be authentic and have some kind of value exchange and a reason for hitting them up that isn't selfish. You know, you're not trying to just get them to buy your new buffet package, but you're actually uh, have a reason and something to offer to them. Right. And Ram, this is perfect for you to end with. Sure. Yeah. I, I think anytime you have you or your brand has messed up, it's just like a real human interaction, right? Laval, if I if I do something shitty to you and I say, you know, and, and my apology. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully we're in quarantine, so low risk. Um, but but right that you you are not going to sort of forgive me and 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 move on and have like a a, an opportunity, you know, want to invite me to do things. If my apology to you is, hey, I'm sorry if you were offended, right? And that's 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 the end of it. Or, oh, let me try and and change my branding. Let me try and change my marketing or my positioning. It, I feel like brands that have uh, truly made mistakes, right? Really messed up on someone. They they owe their customers uh, both a sincere apology and a behavior change. That, that is the only time that I see uh, brands be able to win back people who they've lost, right? And I, I've been someone who's sort of been won back by, um, on occasion, uh, travel and, and hospitality and some airline brands. Uh, I've been won back by a few um, consumer uh, food brands, right? I, but but you, have to, you have to make amends, like you have to show uh, show and take the action I, I think that's the only way to if you don't change your behavior right if the payday loans company doesn't stop being predatory and treating people who you know have no other alternatives uh poorly you're never going to get anything but more hostility right and i don't you know you change your behavior first and then we can consider whether your marketing can do a good job of um of reaching a new audience or earning back customers. Fantastic. Anna Rand Boone, thank you for hanging out with us. This has been fantastic. Yeah. We have um, 
the video. This is recorded, so we'll send, send it to everyone. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us. We bid you all a fantastic uh, day and a better weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Laval. Thank Thanks you. Well. Thank you. Uh, take Thanks the poll. Thank you.